Hello, welcome back. Today we are going to do a little sort of blast from the past. This is absolutely hilarious, this piece. If you look back on my channel to the very first video I ever uploaded, which was, oh, what is it, five years ago? I'd have to go and have a look. I'm actually demonstrating in that how to do this sky. I always, it was always my intention to come back and say how to do it and what different bits you can use and, and all that sort of thing. So I thought we'd do that today. So I went looking in my cupboard to see if I could find the same size canvas as this. And this is a um, about A4. Um, oh, I don't know what that is in American sizes. It's not a size that you guys have because for, um, for like uh, college work and stuff, I think yours sort of comes down about an inch here and it's a little bit wider. It's a different size. But anyway, some sort of canvas, but I haven't got one. So... I have this small one instead, which makes my life easier. And also, it means that if you have a go at this and you like doing it, you could actually make a card. I know there are cards that do like a, an insert, what do you call that, aperture card, that are about this size. So this is a, I think technically it's supposed to be like a five by seven, but like a lot of these things, it's not an exact science. But that's the size we're going to do. And you could definitely really easily get a mount board that would fit around that and um, a, a pre-made frame as well so if you wanted to do that kind of thing instead you you know you don't necessarily have to put it on a canvas it just so happens that I like the unstructured kind of finish so I will show you all the bits and pieces that we can use and then we'll get started at having a go. So the first thing we're going to need is some iron-on interfacing. This is a lightweight iron-on interfacing. It's quite soft. It's the sort of weight you would use for putting on silk or very fine fabrics just to give it a bit of body. So we just want something that's going to give us like a support structure. So this is soft and smooth on one side and then on the other side it's kind of knobbly. Those are the bits of glue. You could use Bonder Web instead, but then you've got the paper backing on it, which makes it quite stiff. And then you might want to put something on it. That'd probably work if you were going to put it in a frame. But anyway, this is what I'm using, a lightweight interfacing. The embellishment bits. So I've got some Angelina fibre. There's a bit of on the end of a trim because this really comes unraveled well, so that will work on something. I've got some fancy wool. This was sent to me by a friend in America as a present. I think her friend makes it. There's a bit of Angelina stuff already done. I've got just ordinary tapestry wools. Some more fancy wool. You can see the sort of things that I look for. This is some ancient rowan tweed. I just really liked it because it looked like the color of sort of slate. Stuff like that. This one's really pretty. This, this is so soft. I think this is mohair and something. And I used that to make this hedgerow bit. So I'm going to show you how to do some of those bits as well. See, so yeah, some Angelina fibre there. And then you can often get bits and pieces of like hand dyed felt and things. And I really like these because they have a lot more gradation to them. I think this is some silk scrim that's hand dyed. This is the tail end of a piece of silk velvet that was dyed. I think I got this all together in like a landscape pack. You can also use like twine, you know, just plain garden twine. So that gives you a rough idea of the sort of embellishments and things. But it really depends what you've got, you know, not, not everybody's got all these bits and pieces, but you might find that there's stuff that you can use and you only need such small bits. I mean, I even have used things like this, it's stuck with a sock, but you can get this kind of thing quite easily. I've forgotten what it's called. It's, um, I think it's just mesh. I think they call that mesh and you can get it in gold and bronze and this again you can um, use alcohol markers on and the colour will stay on it. I often use this as window frames for small things. So because I've done this so many times and I make cards and all sorts of things, I've done big wall hangings for um, exhibitions and what have you. I actually have all of my stuff sorted out into colourways. Yeah this is technically the sky basket because I, I really like anything that's like this. I also have things like um, just normal blues. All of these can be toned down. I mean, us, the sky, I'm looking outside, it's stopped raining now. The sky is very blue today. It's like a pale cerulean blue. <laughs> this time of year, I, I just love the sky. But this one, I love this. You can see it's got gold on one side and I never use that side. But this side, look, look at that. Isn't that amazing? 
so you know it goes all the way from this sort of more um, blue to purple <laughs> I can't think of another word for blue this is one of my absolute all-time favorites look at that I mean that just says this time of year doesn't it it's the sky that sort of watercolor -y effect and the sun breaking through so I think I'm going to use a bit of this today because it's such a small piece that I'm working on I don't often do that size so I'm going to cheat <laughs> Um, I don't know, I might put some other bits in as well. Then here, we've got the Earth basket. I used to make this series of cards called um, the Elements. So I did Earth, Fire, Air and Water, which is why these are so beautifully divided up. And again, I tend to use a lot of batiks to get the texture, so you're not using flat colour. Um, very occasionally, I'll put in some plain bits, but you can just see down here, look at all these scraps. So I keep all of them because they're so, so useful. And there's another one with gold on that I would probably use the gold on the front of that, but I also really like the back too. So have a look through your fabrics, what you might have that would work. So the first thing we need to do is cut off a piece of whatever you're using, interfacing or um, bonder web. So if I just unfold a bit of that. And one of the things to remember, I think I briefly touched on this in a video of uh, last year now, but is to remember that although your design ends here, we need to get this wrapped around the back. Even if you're going to use a mount board on top, you still need to allow about half an inch so that you've got something underneath to support it all it, it it just looks right looks better finished if i wrap that over i can see where that's going to end here that's about okay for me so we're just going to draw around this so i've marked out the edge of my little mini canvas and i just need to cut this off and as well as giving me something to work to drawing around it for the finished size and we will also just put on what I will refer to as the design window. I have my bobbly side up here and make sure that you've got your bobbly side up because we're going to iron all the bits and pieces to this and it would be absolutely terrible if you try and iron them to the other side because you'll end up with this stuck to your ironing board and a load of pieces all over the floor. So the next thing we need to do is measure your design window, not because you need to know the measurements but so that you can so that you can divide it into three so we can make this quite a convincing landscape this is seven inches seven divided by three is i honestly can't do that in my head so basically you want to make sure that the the sky and the the landscape of it are not the same measurement you don't want to divide this into half you want it so that you know either you have more land or you have more sky, so that's what we're going for. So I'm gonna give myself about two and a half inches to do the landscape. So I'm just gonna put a little line across there. I think I wanna focus on the sky. If you look at this one, you can see this is divided into unequal bits as well. So that's what we're going for. So I think what I want to do today is something very similar to the large one that I showed you, but I think I want a bit more kind of a, little, a few more hills in that a bit more of a contrast so I think because this is wonky we're gonna just bring it out across here down to about there I'm gonna get a piece of paper to show you so it's a bit clearer so if we draw around this so I've got a design window again so if we just guess roughly across there and then I wanted to bring like a sort of a hilly bit here down here and I was talking about doing the sea so my horizon line is probably going to be there and then I've got some other little bits here I think it would be really nice to have a little bit of crossing over to make this sort of like a like a river running down to it so we need the little crossover bit so if I just roughly draw those in you could even put in later on in the embellishment thing you could put I don't know a tree something and some fuzzy bits some more fuzzy bits so this is just like a very rough idea of of what we're going for and it just helps um 
with the planning stage because you can see you can refer to that and and go oh yeah I wanted to do this or you know whatever now comes the exciting bit we're going to start using bits and pieces of fabric so what I'm doing now is looking at my picture and trying to work out what looks like a reflection so because you've got sky 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 horizon line reflection this and this have to be similar with something like this it's quite easy to do because we've got a bit of pink here and then it's sort of reflected again there. Yeah, I, I really, I really like that. I think a lot of the work's already done for you, isn't it? It's just amazing, this fabric. So I'm using uh, my bit of interfacing. I'm only gonna allow a tiny little bit here. I'll probably have to put something extra on just because I want the particular pinks and everything underneath to show in the sort of watery part, so. And the great thing is about using very light interfacing is you can see through it as well, an idea of what it's gonna look like. And I think that's gonna give me the best sort of reflection, I think. On here, I don't know if you can see my mark. So here's my horizon line, and here's where I'm gonna start doing, you know, hills and stuff. And the, so the sky and this watery fabric have to come all the way down underneath this bit. So I'm gonna mark that. On here so let's cut that off don't worry about creases at the moment we'll get the iron out and sort that out here's my interfacing so I want to make sure it covers over that line there and remember I was allowing extra to go over the edge so we don't end up with a stitch line on the edge specifically that would be for canvas but again even if you're not going to put this on a canvas and you're going to put it in a card or free bit you still want something to tuck underneath I'm not sure I want all of the sky to be the same. And if I take off maybe this bit, I deliberately don't cut straight lines in this. Need to get away from the straight line thing because it shows up <laughs> so much if you're just slightly out. Whereas if you're aiming for not straight, it, it looks okay. And it looks more naturalistic too. So I'm just pinning that in place so that I can, again, look at my little reference drawing. So I'm looking to cut away some of this excess now. Um, so that when I come to iron on the next piece, there'll be something to hold it in place. Whereas if it's all covered up in this, there's nothing. So if I just find out where this is, I'm just lifting it and cutting it, not quite to the line, just with a little bit of an allowance. So now I need to decide what I'm going to put on the top bit here. At this point, you don't need to worry about cutting any more pieces off. Probably scraps will work really, really well. So what we want up here is something that's a deeper blue. The sky is the darkest up here, and then it's sort of like an ombre effect and goes very pale and then we've got the reflection in it. Oh, that looks quite good. Maybe something in between. There's sort of a, a blue there. Oh, that works. Yeah, I think I'll probably leave it at those two. So this bit needs to go under here because then we can get the most naturalistic edge. And then this one again, one side slightly straighter than the other. So we tuck the straight, straight side underneath there and then we'll do the same again with this one and I think it's time for me to get the ironing board out. So that's what our sky is going to look like. I just need to find something to put down here so I'm going to use this bit. Where the um, edges are overlapping I tend to just put a few pins in to hold it while I'm still working on it before I get to the sewing machine. So I've just went through my selection of earthy colours. I've just put, literally just pulled out strips because I'm going to use so little of this. So I'm going for something based on kind of where I live, which this time of year is you know, bright blue sky when it's not raining. Lots of different greens, like the fields are going that sort of sad yellow, but they're not quite brown yet. And the main thing for me is to make sure I get my the gradient of my colours right with some flashes of brighter that like green and stuff like that in there. So these are the pieces that I ironed and it's a good idea if you're using scraps to try and arrange them in some sort of colour depth. Remember I'm going for a sort of autumnal landscape so I haven't gone for anything very vibrant like the velvet. I don't want to do that today. I'm just going to slide all of these up here. I could use this very stark dark one. So straight away, because we've got the light coming from behind, we've got like a little bit of a silhouette thing going on. I think that works really well. Also, remember this is the design window here and what I'm looking at is keeping what we're calling our reflection. Just want to keep a tiny little bit of that. So that's sort of deciding where this is going.
so you'll have just seen me iron on the back to make sure everything's stuck down. I've been pinning the direction that I'll be sewing from. The blue is self-explanatory, it all goes that way. So we'll start sewing from that end and just stitch along there and that'll be done. But these bits, they need to be done in the right order to make it nice and neat. So the first piece we do is this one, the second one we do is this one, then we do this one, then this one, and this one. And then we do this one, this one doesn't really matter when you do it, just as long as it's stitched down. It's just We just want to cover up these ends of sewing. So now to the thread selection. Fortunately, um, there's quite a lot of these grungy green colours. So although this is black, a blackish sort of brown, I actually think this grungy green, definitely on the camera, it looks the right colour. So that's the one we'll be doing on there. I could use this variegated. I think that might work quite well. Remember this is going to be covered over with other bits and pieces as well and uh, there'll be like an overlay of organza as well so you know if, if literally you've got two shades of green use those it's fine. A note on needles and thread. I'm using just a standard Singer sewing machine. What I use for these is either metallic needles or top stitch needles and I did have some but I can't find them which is a titanium point, uh, the like, titanium coated and what that means is if you're using fancy threads like rayon or metallic, if you start off with a new needle you won't wear a little notch in it which is why thread breaks when you're doing any type of uh, free machine embroidery if you like. Um, it starts to wear like this this not literally a notch in the needle and which acts like a pair of snippers and it means that every 10 inches or so possibly less your thread will snap which is jolly annoying and extremely wasteful to get over that problem <laughs> use a top stitch needle or a metallic needle and then watch where the needle goes where it comes down so for mine i know rather annoyingly and it is annoying because all my other machines come down to the left or the right this one comes down in the middle which makes it really hard to do complicated stitches like if you want to use any of your fancy stitches on your machine it's really hard to keep it straight so there's our little zigzag just carry on in the same same vein really so there's that bit stitched on and you can see I've not been massively accurate but you don't need to be because we want this to look as naturalistic as possible so having some shapes to break up the horizon is really really helpful so this is what it looks like now the last few things we need to do are do some embellishments. So I'm going to show you how to make some sort of things that look like hedgerows and bushes. And um, then I'll show you the overlays with the organza. Oh, <laughs> you could go and look at the first video. But no, I'll show you again with this one how it works. So you might remember I showed you this gorgeous wool. You could use something like this on its own without really doing anything. It's so uneven in the spin. The yarn has got little properly bits and things so I'll just pop that on there. So I promised I'd show you how to make the little fuzzy hedgerow that looks like this. Um, some of it's just bits of yarn, this one, um, stitched in and I'll show you how to do that and then other bits are folded in with a, a bit of organza. So I'll just show you how to do this and you do it on the sewing machine. You need to find something that's variegated. You could use um, tapestry wool, you could use bobbly wool, anything that has got a little bit of texture and some varying colours. So what you do with your machine is find the end and then just sort of wrap a bit round your fingers like that and a little sort of loop. And this is just to get you started off. You put this under the presser foot set your tension to more of a normal tension so wherever the little box is and literally just start sewing slowly and then you just start pushing varying lengths underneath and you can make it quite full you can make it a bit sparse so if you look at hedgerows you'll see there's some trees there's some bits that are very short there's shrubby bits there's all sorts of things so we're just going for a difference in height it doesn't have to be perfect you can trim this because we're going to have to snip through all of these loops anyway so just make yourself a strip probably about eight inches long and then that should be enough to do the whole thing. So I'll carry on doing that.
this is probably a little bit big at the moment. It's a bit long, the strands. But you can see straight away how it really works well with those colours. And then the best thing to do at this stage is using a nice green thread or something that's going to blend in. So I'm just going to use the same rail that I had before and set it to a zigzag. And I'm just going to zigzag that on with a really, really wide zigzag. So I'm just going to cut into this, make it a bit smaller because it's a bit tall for something that far away. So this is going to be in the backgroundy part. I think I'll put some organza over the sky and I might even have it coming down over this part and then put those fuzzy green bits on that I showed you. So I'll get the different colours of organza. So here I've got a uh, white, it's very bright white and a blush pink here. So before we cut anything off, if you just get a single layer and you start laying it over, you can see that you can get a beautiful sort of pearly sky going on. And I was thinking of ending it here, so it's pushing that back. So that's with the blush pink. And this is with the white, because I can't find the dove grey. So I'm going to cut a piece that will fit over this entire bit and then worry about the shapes afterwards, just because I don't want it to be too small. It moves around an awful lot. And I'm just going to put some little strips of organza in the sky. I'm using the blush pink for this because I want to warm it up a bit. See, you can barely see it, but it's starting to add some sort of wispy clouds in there so that tells me that I'd like to put another little bit in here. Suddenly we've got a sky with depth and texture, we've got hills in the background. The only problem with the organza is if you stitch into it it shows. Most glues will show as well. You can use um, just a Pritt stick or something just to hold it at both sides and then this top bit will be stitched all the way around and that's what I do. I used to stitch them on but I don't like seeing the stitching. I don't mind so much up here, the, like the rayon and all that, but I think that looks really good. It looks really sort of misty and lovely. So that's what I'm going to do with mine. I'll stick all the bits on and then I'll put the overlay back on and pin it, stitch it and then cut it. stitched on the top layer. I'll leave all of this just pinned. It's just because I don't want to change the colour of thread and I know I'm going to be using the green again in a minute so I'll change it to something less noticeable when I've actually finished and I'll just stitch that down. And then this bit you just start snipping it and pulling it and the stitching will hold it in place. So that's that shape there. And then we're going to use our little fuzzy bits of wool to stitch down here I think. Ah, I think originally I meant to do that bit underneath. Could do it on top or I could just do it there. I think I like it there and I wanted a bit along here as well. And what we need to do is make sure that it covers up that edge of fabric. So again we'll set it on quite a generous zigzag. And then if you've got some other fuzzy bits you could either use some more like this but trimmed down and in a, a paler colour like more greens and stuff or some tapestry wool or I'm going to use that silk stuff that I can't remember the name of. If you can remember what it's called can you pop the name in the comments because it's completely slipped my mind I started filming yesterday. I think I want some of this yellowy stuff here and you can do the same looping and trimming but it does use quite a lot. What I tend to do is just pull some out. If you've got rough fingers it sticks to you and of course I've got glue on my hands as well and just fuzzy it up a bit. In fact it might be easier if I just wrap it roughly and then you can snip into it. So I'm going to stitch this piece on first and then this piece and then I'll just snip into that and I'm going to leave it there for today. Obviously you can see you can just keep adding layer after layer after layer after layer and you can you know, what you could do is have like a tree starting in the foreground and then put another, you know, have that going over the top of this. You could put another layer on top. There's, there's loads of things you can do. But for a first attempt, if you're going to have a go at this, I, I think this is, once I've finished all this bit, I think that's a good place to stop. 
You could also use a blind hem stitch, works really well on this. And in fact, I think I'm going to change to a blind hem stitch. And a blind hem stitch is the one that does um, about four running stitches in a row and then one zigzag. It's easier to lose in the attaching of things like this. So that's what it looks like when it's just been stitched. And then before I do anything else, before I call it done, I'm just going to check on the back and see where my design window is. And I think it's just there, which means that this bit looks a little bit naked. So now we're just going to pull this up, just snip through the silk loops. And then it won't look like it's been twisted round. It'll actually look a bit more gloriously fuzzy, which I think is really nice. And I've just realised I've done this whole project using paper scissors. No wonder everything was a bit, yeah, was catching a bit. So I think just to finish this piece off, I'm just going to pull this up as well. You could just add another, um, I could add another piece to that if I wanted to, just to give it a bit more sort of definition. You can push things up that look like a tree, but I want that to keep receding into the distance, so I'm going to put something here. See, I think this might be a bit... Oh, I don't think that's so much of a problem. I'm going to use this end here. And so this has been stitched twice. This is one of the pieces I didn't manage to um, cut apart. I'm just going to plonk that there, I think. See what this looks like unraveled. I think I might put that in like an extra little bit. So I don't know if you saw, I didn't quite stitch through this the first time. So when I came back through, I just made sure I'd got that bit. So now I'm just going to cut the loops off. So I'm calling that done. I was going to show you how to put it on a canvas or how to mount it in a frame. I think what I might do is a little, very short video on just how to put things onto a canvas. So I've got a couple of bits and pieces that I can I can demonstrate how to do that. Oh, what I'll do is I'll pin it on the canvas so we can have like a reveal at the end. So here it is at this stage of finishedness. I've just pinned it onto the canvas, which is why it's a little bit wrinkly. That'll all come out when it's actually glued on. But you can see that you've got, you know, you've got the sky and it's all sort of blended in and waterfally. And then you've got the like the horizon and the sea and reflections and we put all these little hedgerows and things in. And yeah, I think it's uh, it's quite cute. It's a little bit plain. I think it could do with some other bits and pieces. And at this point it is only pinned on. So I might go in and embroider some things over the top to push it back even more. I might do a, like a giant seed head or something. So you're sort of looking through the grass or something like that. Might do a tree, might not. Um, anyway, have a go. And I hope it's um, something that you can get really creative with and be really inspired to look at all your bits and pieces in a, in a different way. You don't need very many special materials. Obviously, I've got loads of this stuff because I've done it as a workshop and I've done wall hangings and I'm actually working on a piece from a photograph using the same technique which is about I can't remember if it's three feet square or if it's four feet square but it's pretty big anyway it's like a view through a window so that's why I have so many bits and pieces and um, keep sending me comments and I love reading all your comments and thanks for joining me and I'll see you again soon bye